There's many, many ways you can and will and have shape your waterfront, and this conference is all about giving you tools, giving you information to help you do that better in the future. So we have a tremendous opportunity, it seems to me, in living near water to take advantage of the life-enhancing quality of life benefits. We cannot leave water transportation behind. Ferries have changed in their roles. Ferries are becoming a linear urban ferry, so they're deliberately providing for ease of congestion. And the fare will be affordable, same as the subway, with free transfers between routes. The cost of someone to get into the, on the ferry should be the same as someone that pay for the metro car. The answer is integration with other forms of mass transit, including the ferries themselves. We always saw this as a need for a complete and balanced transportation system. There's nobody better positioned than the Waterfront Alliance than, you know, to kind of spearhead real substantive engagement so that we make this ferry system really ship to shore so that it really delivers on that promise. We have to have, and what I've been saying for a long time and I think people are getting to realize this, is we have to have a major container port on both sides of the harbor, in Brooklyn as well as in New Jersey. We have the workforce here that we can supply. We have tens of thousands of jobs that are needed as the aging workforce on all these various waterfront aspects, ship chandlers, freight forwarders, there's a whole industry. There has been a lot of ignorant talk by some people in the, uh, by some people, that we should close the port at Red Hook. It's a small port, doesn't do that much business, and after all, if you closed it, it's valuable real estate. And you could sell it, it could become condos, or this or that, or whatever. Um, we must not do that, period. Because once we lose these pieces of property for what we are all talking about, maritime, industrial, we lose them forever. They become extinct. We don't get them back. I need to know what the employers in the harbor need from our graduates so that I make sure that our program serves those needs. How are we really doing? And can we assess the long-term needs and progress on climate change adaptation here in New York? Let's be candid with ourselves. Uh, we're doing better but we're not doing uh, well enough. We can expect in the coming years that the number of people that will be impacted is going to increase 84%. So we're looking at at least 400,000 people that will be in flood areas. This is going to impact many, many more low-income and working people. It's not going to be just the infrastructure that gets built on the waterfront, but the building code changes that slowly change the DNA of the city to make us more resilient to the long-term and sudden shocks that we face. I think. What we most need is options for scales and timeframes of action between the giant Army Corps multi-decades mega project and individual property owners doing it on their own. In terms of putting together living shorelines or, or ecologically enhanced bulkhead and revetments, having a consistent guideline to do that, and of course at the time of our study, the, the wedge study was not yet out, but I just wanted to highlight that the wedge study is the kind of advancement that we're looking for in terms of getting people on the same page, putting together some guidelines and, and advancing the science together. We're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about energy grids, all of which is of the utmost important. I don't want to distract us from that at all. But remembering that the concept of social resiliency is something that's going to allow us to weather future storms. So a definition I might offer for social resiliency is our ability as a community or as groups of people to cope with external stresses and disturbances that are a result of social, political, or environmental change. Every time you suggest change anywhere, the, ref the reflex reaction is no. And the only way to get past that is by really having an open communicative process that brings people in and hears people beyond their first opening statement. So I think one thing that's very, very important is um, humanizing this whole idea about what is green infrastructure, what is a restored marsh island, and getting people engaged and excited and passionate about these places. Yeah, I mean, we're taking every opportunity we can find to educate community uh, around the urgency of the threat, but also the opportunity uh, to act and make our city even better. We're trying to get to three recommendations 
and these rec recommendations as part of an exercise of thinking and getting the input from people that actually live there and the experts in the room that come to the MWA conference. So this is exciting. Basically, we want to, to people in the community don't really use the creek side because there's no reason for them to use the creek. Uh, we want to, to give them reason now uh, for it uh, by either having kayaks, um, uh, a boathouse, something that they can identify that this is in their backyard. Having a dialogue about how human development uh, can be more sustainable and can be can contribute to resiliency uh, is really valuable for us. And that's what we've got bringing everybody together here. Ultimately, it's progress. We're moving forward. Um, no one's going to argue that there's a lot more to be done. This is definitely a generational um, affair that we've kicked off. But the important news is that we continue to act and we continue to, to uh, source the money we need, we continue to build the partnerships we need, and we continue to make, uh, to make our city safer against the, the impacts of climate change as well as other 21st century threats.